This programme was made with the support of Sound and Vision, Broadcasting Funding Scheme, a BCI initiative. And what if you were a hetter, and you married a hetter, and all your sons and daughters worked as hetters, and you inhabited a het house all full of heads, 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 heads? Well, it meant a, a lot to the economy of the town because in its heyday there was, I suppose, maybe up to 200 people working there. And I mean, the town population was less than 5,000 at the time, so that it, you know, it was a, it was a great money spinner for the town. But without it, it would have been, I don't know, we'd have all immigrated. I mean, I would certainly have immigrated, and the other 200 would have gone as well. So at least it kept people at, at home. And um, it was certainly a great boost to, the, to, to Castlebar. It helped, it helped Castlebar in the bad old days. There was 90,000 square feet of a building. And for that 90,000 square feet, so much history has been made. It was one of the most modern buildings of its day. You had Jews, you had Roman Catholics who came from Belgium, you had Jews who came from Belgium, from Czechoslovakia. People came from England, working there in the 60s. And, and there was a multitude of, of, of nationalities, religions, personalities, skills, women and men, and that broke many barriers, like the first woman director. So for a, for a company of its size, a small company of its size in, in today's terms, the wages weren't great, but the atmosphere was second to none. In the 1930s, the town of Castle Bar, like most West of Ireland towns at the time, suffered greatly at the hands of unemployment and emigration. People in their thousands headed for a better life in England and America in the realisation that there were few prospects of any work at home. Every family felt the heartbreak of watching loved ones head for the boats and realised that for many, it would be the last time they'd see their homeland. As the 30s progressed, the Irish government knew that towns like Castlebar needed some form of employment in order to sustain those left behind, and manufacturing was earmarked as a possible lifeline to some form of sustainability. In the late 1930s, a number of the town's businessmen conceived the idea of enticing European investors to set up in Castlebar, and with government interest growing, Alice Quinn's Field, a nine-acre site located on the Newport Road was identified as a location for a factory. With the support of a number of experts from Belgium and other foreign experts, Castlebar's hat factory was conceived. In 1939, after intense lobbying and discussions, an agreement was secured to build a factory that was to have a major impact on the town. Four months before the outbreak of World War II, Work began on the construction of the factory, and even though the two local contractors who carried out the building works, J.P. McCormick and James Chambers, had to battle with the scarcity of supplies, the hat factory was completed in September 1941 and ready for the initial 150 people who worked there. It was a unique structure, built almost entirely of concrete and specially constructed to allow for an abundance of light the building was renowned for its 120-foot-high chimney stack and it included various areas that were required to carry out what was an intricate process of making hats. Ernie Sweeney, who worked in the factory for many years, always had an interest in the historical elements of the factory. The idea was mooted back in 1934. A Senator Eddie Metlin and a committee were set up to bring in industry into the West. Now, there were very far-seeing and very hard-working men, I must say, that wanted to build up the new nation and prove to the world that they were uh, industrious. So uh, there was four businesses set up. Uh, Castle Bar, they finished it in six months. It was one of the most modern buildings in Ireland at the time. And the Green Party today would kiss them and love them and give them all the grants in the world because they made maximum use of light, glass, steam, turf, and the water from the lake. It was built in such a way that it utilised the sunlight and they didn't have to use much electricity. It had its own power source, electricity. Well, it was connected to the grid in Castle Bar. It had its own water supply. It had its own telephone system within. And uh, that was so modern, flushing toilets. Because a lot of people who would have come 
from the outskirts of the town and parts of the town at that time would not have had flushing toilets. And people who were, would have went into the factory for the first time, they would have to learn how to flush toilets. Uh, a phone would have been an amazing thing and they had intercom inside, electricity, they had their own carpenter shop, they had their own blacksmith shop and engineering shop. They were very, very self-sufficient. And, and they had their own pump house for their own supply of water, their own storage, everything. The arrival of outsiders to Castlebar to run the hat factory was a major culture shock for the locals. These Jewish people had intensive experience in the manufacturing of hats, but their customs and religious beliefs proved a major learning curve to the workers in the factory. So what were they like to work for? Local workers Peggy Lee and Pat Flanagan recall their memories of getting to know and understand their new employers. Even though I worked in the office, I knew all of them, we'll say, on the floor of the factory, they were mostly in managerial positions. Some of them had good English, one or two had not great English, but um, got on well with all the, the employees, as far as I could see. People worked hard there for small wages. The manager, Mr Porgus, he was a Jew, and all the others, Mr Smallkind, Mr Glass, Mr Clipper, Mr Chernick, Mr Dealens. But they, they, they kept to themselves, really. Outside of work, they, they, they didn't mix that much. Two or three of them had families and they would have uh, been into sport and that the two of them now, Annie Pelosi and Vera Glass, uh, they, they were very involved in the tennis club. One of the families, they they converted to Catholicism from from being Jews. They practised. I mean, you never looked at them as being different and they never looked on us as being different, as far as I could say. I found them very nice anyway, I really did. But then I didn't have that much to do with them in a work situation. Of course, Mr Pargus was a Jew, but he was, he was such a lovely man, a fine man, I could say that. Um, an honest man, outspoken man. You know, he... he you knew where you stood with them. And at the back of it, he was very kind. We got paid just about an average wage. That was it. Uh, they wouldn't hand out anything extra special to us. We had to fight for it. But they were fair. The management were fair. And indeed, there was a cha- the manager who was there all in my life was Mr. Purgus. He was from Czechoslovakia. When the factory started in 19... It, was, it opened in 1939. And about eight people from around Europe, they were all Jews, came to Castle Bar. How, how they got to know about the factory, I don't know. But they came and uh, because war was just about to break out and they knew there would be trouble with, with Hitler. And uh, there was eight of them. There was a Mr. Purgus was manager. There was a Mr. Schmalka. There was a Mr. Dealens. Uh, there was about eight of them that came uh, and, and as supervisors. They weren't terrific at, at, at knowing how to produce a hat, but they were very intelligent people. And um, about a month after the factory opened, some 30, 20 year olds from the factory, both boys and girls, went out to where I went in Vervia. And they were only there about 10 days when war broke out, and they had to come back quick. So they never got the opportunity to learn what they went out for. But the, the, they came back, anyways, and I don't know. They got on with those, the fact that they were only there for a week or two. They were supposed to spend, I think, six weeks there, and they only had two weeks. But they were, <laughs> they were glad to be back because the war had been declared. That's why they were all, the Jews that came and opened the, the, the factory. And uh, they, they, they loved Castlebar. They loved Ireland. None of, they all stayed here, you know. The Pelizes and the Glasses and the Purguses and the Dealenses, they all stayed here once, they, even when they were retired. Yeah, Purgus, he, he died here, you know. So uh, Dealens went back when he was a very old man to his hometown. They loved, they loved Castle Bar and, and Ireland. Susanna Sweeney, now a lecturer at GMIT in Castle Bar, did a master's in women's studies. And as part of her work, she spoke to many of the women who worked in the hat factory. In particular, she remembers how a predominantly Roman Catholic workforce didn't have it all their own way, particularly in the Marian year. 
in the, the blessing of the Marian year. They were not allowed to go to the church. They would not get the hour off to go. So they organized to have a shrine in the head factory. And the, the women and the men went to the church and everything. And then their wages was deducted because that hour they went to church, they were not paid for. So it was a bit of a scene there. But the women, they had to wear the berries before their work and outside work. They had to wear the berries and the men had to wear the hats. They were made to advertise what they were actually making. When the half factory closed down in 81, there was no Jewish involvement because old age came into play. You must remember when they came here in 1939, they would have been middle-aged or a little older and they were forced to come here. They had no choice. They were on a survival course, really, and they invested their money. But then as time went on, one of them was, uh, most of them were not hat makers at all. They were the sons of hat makers or the grandsons of a big industry abroad. They were professional barristers, solicitors, uh, accountants and all that. So one of them uh, got a job in Paris in 1940 as a banker, top banker. And he went over to Paris and he ended up in Belson's camp with his whole family, but they survived. And there are letters at the moment in the town uh, which they wrote thanking the family in the town here who helped them with the Red Cross parcels, who they stayed with in Castlebar while they were running the factory. Then uh, one of them went back and he had to join the army, the Belgium army, and they had a party for him. He was the manager and he had, and the people were very... And there's a good article about that in, in the Connick Telegraph of the, of the period at the time. And uh, others moved out and they went to Dublin and they went to Belfast and that, different places. And Mrs Glass only died there a few years ago in her late 90s in Belfast. And she was a, the wife of Mr Glass, who was one of the managers. And Mr and Mrs Purgis stayed on and they actually died here. That was the last of the Jewish connection. Mr. Palazzi died in '42, and they exhumed his body up out of the Church of Ireland graveyard. As construction of the factory began, the new owners realised that some locals would have to be trained in the technical processes of making hats, and a selection of men and women were sent to Belgium to learn the various stages. It was to be the first time that those chosen had ever left the town of Castle Bar, and a young Pat Flanagan vividly remembers the adventure. I was in the vocational school. The, the year was 1952. Tom Ketsley came to me and he said, uh, there's a job going on in the factory. They've started to produce berries. And he said, uh, you should go for it because it's, it'd be a fairly nice number. So I said, fine, and I went back interviewed and a couple of days later got the job. So I started to work with the Mr. Lizzie back, who had come from Switzerland. But unfortunately, he loved Ireland so much. He had a contract for three years that he wanted to remain in Ireland. So the manager of the factory at the time said, fair enough, we'll send him to our parent company in Verve in Belgium. Uh, the scenario was I was 16 years of age at the time. I hadn't a word of French. And uh, the manager said, you'll, you've got to go. So I went home and told Mam, and she said, well, fair enough if you want to go. Well, I said, I'm sure it'll be a great experience, but I'll miss you. But off I went. I was there for 10 months, spent the Christmas there. There were no telephone calls, only there was the old Connick Telegraph every, every week came from my mum, and I used to write every week. So I came back, and Mr. Elizabeth then left, and I took over the berry department. Well, in Belgium, they, they had a berry factory there, and I learned how the, how the berry was produced. It was knitted from, from, from wool on the knitting machines, which are very intricate, and I had to learn all about the setting of them for the different sizes, the different brim sizes, the quality, of course, as well. So uh, that's what I was at for, for nine months. And then I went to, to a place in France called Troyes, where they made the machines. And I learned how the machines were assembled so that I could uh, work on them whenever they broke down. So I came back and I took over in 19, it was then 1953. I came back and I was there until uh, I was made redundant in uh, 1990. A group of women were sent over to Belgium to learn the art of uh, hoot making and hat making. And they were sent over there and one of, the, one of the women, Kathleen Loftus, she wrote to the Connacht and uh, wrote a report 
about what happened. And in one of the reports, she's telling that they went out on a Sunday, they were off. They went for a walk and they went as far as the border because it was, the war was breaking out and they were just interested in would they see some German soldiers. You know, so they actually went over the border and they were sent home then by, by bus in late in the night and people were worried that there were, something happened. Yes, they were actually stopped and say, what are you doing here? Every week she wrote a letter and that was printed in the Connacht. And that would keep the people in Kasabar up to date with what was happening. So they got a first hand view from the war front. <laughs> there was letters written to the Connacht Telegraph by one of the Loftus sisters. And it was the cream. It wasn't the ordinary five eighths that went out. It was real good ambassadors. There were girls who came out of secondary school and boys. And as they say in the old days, they were well educated. And they were great ambassadors. And this young Loftus girl could speak fluent French. And she used to write a letter every two weeks to the Connacht Telegraph. Hello from Belgium. The training programme proved to be a vital cog in the ultimate success of the hat factory in Castle Bar. The various processes were painstakingly meticulous and quality control was paramount. There were numerous departments within the factory, each putting their own individual stamp on the making of the now renowned hats. The, the materials came in from South Africa and uh, they came in from Australia. And uh, they had to buy up and rent an awful lot of storage around the town because the war broke out. So there was big 500 weight bales. I remember them myself coming in. Uh, they came in by the railway station and Mr. Old Mr. Ainsworth and there was another man who used to drive down and they had a crane to lift them up into the store. Now that's the front of the building that you see today. And that was the wool store. And the raw wool then would be brought down and was on the right hand side and that was called the wet side of the factory. And on the left hand side close to Castle Bar was called the dry side. And the reason I can give you the reason for that, the wool would go down then into the carbonizers, carbonizing machines that carbonize the, the, the material, the wool, tear it up into small pieces. And then it turned out to be the most beautiful, soft, soft wool. The first shape of the hood will be there. Green Party wouldn't be happy with this as well. They used to use a chemical called trichoy. The girls, when they first use it, they faint. They collapse and they faint with it because it was so strong. I, I took a sniff with myself and I was to take out the little living matter that had been in the wool and kill it. Uh, but their, their noses were very raw then. They got immune to it. Uh, but the new ones would faint. And then it, it, it got through the carbon ivers, carbonizing machine. You see them down in um, Foxwood Mills now today. And the machinery was from the 1840s, brought in secondhand from the 1840s, 1850s, uh, to be used in 1940 in Castle Bar. And uh, down then into the uh, blocking room, that was the damp area, and they had timbers on the floor, and the girls had to wear clogs, timber clogs, because of the acid, uh, to save their shoes, and their timber it was very damp. All oh, the conditions uh, was savage. And... Um, uh, the, the, that was the blocking area and, and that shaped the hoods more and then they went down into the baths to be dipped in acid. Acid. And of course that would be all flushed out into the river as well. And down into the pouncing area. There was big machines and they pounce like that. Big leather belts turning the old world wheels. You see it on the old 1920s films showing industry around the world. And down into... Um, Tom Jennings and them, they used to pull the hoods down on the blocks to shape them. And they had welts on their hands and they could leave a roasting hot iron on it. Wouldn't feel it. The welts were so big on their hands. Big, big welts pulling pulling these hoods into shape. And then into the dye house and into the bats. Big stainless steel dye bats and Arthur Campbell was there. And they had their own chemist set up as well. Chemistry and all that. And dye them. Mercury was used. So that's where the old uh, saying comes from, mad hatters, because the, the, the fumes of the mercury, some of it would be vapour, and it vaporise, and it would go, go into your skin. They'd store the hoods, batches and batches of hoods, on the ground, down on the cellars, and the river would rise, and the dampness, it was like, it was like mushrooms. <laughs> they didn't grow like mushrooms, but the dampness done something to the hoods, whatever, and then they'd bring them up, Big, big, big lots of them that bring them up and that put them onto these machines and that use shark skin. They put the shark skin on it to smooth, to take all the roughness away. And then over into Frank Quinn and he'd do something else then with another machine. Then up into Pat Kearney and he'd stretch them.
then up into Jack Kinsella and he'd do stretch them more and Sean McDonough and Tom Burke and all them stretch them more and then the, the hat would be shaped Pat Kearney then would shape the lovely hats beautiful hats Mary Rowland then would line them with lovely silk and a lovely band and we had our own printing works there gold gold printing works and then from that then up to the packer the, the girls then would sew on there was the sewing room and then up into the Packers for export, Gertie Quinn and Dennis Sline. And he'd be singing, just my baby and me and my honey mix three in blue heaven. And he'd be singing away there amongst the boxes. Skilled and unskilled workers became part of what was a growing success story in Castlebar in the 50s and 60s. They all became experts in their various tasks. Jack Loftus recounts some of his memories of working in the factory. Well, in 1959, I went in and I went uh, into where they would be making the women's hoods for export and where they would be making the men's hoods for export. Now, this was uh, after Paddy Gilligan, who was one of the head men in the spinning department. His ladies produced from the wool these hoods, spun them. From there, then, they went to Andy Leonard, where his department took the hoods they sized them, they reduced them, they made them more firm, and from there then they went into the dye house by who was Arthur Campbell was in charge, and he dyed them according to the colours required because most of these hoods were exported to Luton in England for to be made into women's hats at the time. They also made men felt hoods, and uh, these were made into men's hats where Tom Kittrick was in charge of. So I was a, a small while really at the start of that and then I went with Tom in about 1962 uh, onto the hat section where we m made men's hats, all shapes, all sizes. And I was with Tom until about 1964 when they decided that uh, they would go into the tweed, into making cloth, men's caps, hats and all type of things. So in 1964, I went to England for three months training in to Leeds to a firm that they got in touch with. And I learned all the, the trade, really, about cutting out uh, and the sewing up and all that. And then when I came back, they acquired a man by the name of McLaughlin. And I went working with him then from about 1964 on. In 1972, he died suddenly on the golf course. And after that, uh, I didn't have the same feeling for the factory as I had previously. And I started looking around then for another job. And December 1972, then I left. I started in the hat factory in 1950, left school, always wanted to be in an office. And uh, a job came up there. I was interviewed and I got the job. I worked in... Uh, the office in, with about five more uh, people. There was uh, Miss Ryan, Brian Hoban, who was the chief clerk there, Frank uh, Brennan, uh, both of them are gone to God now, and uh, a man called Mr Glass, who dealt with the foreign correspondence, uh, Nelly Riley and, and Londra. Miss Egan was there when I went in, and uh, when she left, then uh, Nelly Riley came in to take her place. It was a big experience for me because I was very lucky, uh, mostly in, that was in 1950, an awful lot of people um, of my age had to immigrate. There weren't that many jobs, so it was great to be at home. I think I was always a home bird. My father had was working there for oh, about five years before me. He replaced a man called Mr Chernick, who was the electrical engineer there and my dad took over then the responsibility of all the electrical equipment and I was there until 1961 when I got married. You know in those days you didn't move around from job to job you were lucky to have a job and you stayed. I was employed as a short end typist come receptionist I'd say. Uh, I dealt with uh, Mr Pargus the manager's work. I, I would uh, kind of work close to him along with reception work and um, I loved it. I, 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 I loved the work I had and I, I liked the people I worked with. It was well established. The, the Jewish people uh, were responsible back in the early 40s for bringing the company to Castlebar and setting it up and giving great employment. 
so I was there then I got married in 61 and of course in 61 you had to leave government conditions that you left and you you took up your job washing dishes and <laughs> housework and rearing children all the ladies the females we all had to wear headgear well, you couldn't go to work if you hadn't you'd be looked at uh, if you had no berry on you or yeah mostly berries because we were you see then it was it was business for the factory we all had to buy our berries we didn't get them for nothing and um, the men wore hats I had a bike I used to cycle to work you know and come home from my lunch and back again and home then for 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 the evening and sure it was great to be free then once you got out of work I and I'm told that I can't be remembered flying down on this bike with the berry on me I was in charge of every berry that was produced. I was responsible for what it, what, how it finished. The book stopped with me. Yeah, it's rather intricate. Uh, the, the yarn, the raw yarn came from Keltimaa. They had a spinning plant in Keltimaa at the time. And we, we, uh, I used to go up there now and again and order maybe a ton of stuff at the time, you know, of yarn. Now, the yarn, it was easily broken and it uh, had to be wound onto spindles and uh, put onto the back of the machine, thread it, and into, into the, the, where, where, where the knitting took place. It took a berry uh, about eight minutes to knit. But of course, the, there was a hole in the, in the middle of it and it had to be linked up the middle. So there was a linking machine there then for linking it and making it into a sort of a circle. But at this stage, it was maybe 15 inches in diameter. So and it was very flimsy, so it had to be hardened and 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 shrunk, and and and, and formed into a, a circle. So that's where the where the work started. The girls were were excellent. They were mostly all girls. There were only two lads working with me. The rest of them were girls. There was about fifteen or sixteen. The berry then was shrunk in a bumping machine. There were two big hammers banging them for a couple of hours with chemicals, and then they were brought into the dye house to be dyed in the different colours. And then they were formed with two half moons and they were put into a dryer for overnight. There was a, mach- a machine for shearing them. So there was a fair amount of work done to make the finished article. But they were most popular in, in the 50s. And they went on until about 1972. And then they went out of, sort of out of fashion. So they decided to go into the knitwear, making jumpers. And I went away then to the IIRS in in, uh, in Dublin for about eight weeks learning about uh, knitting machines for jumpers, jackhard stuff and all like that. And the IRS then took over the factory and I worked there with them until rehab then came in and I worked with them there until I finished in 1990. I, there was a mechanic there called Mr. Byrne that uh, he, he would come and uh, if there was something I wanted him to make, he was terrific at making parts, you know. Uh, we produced something like what, about 3,000 a week. Uh, they were mostly for all ladies. You know. But then we did army berries as well with, with a leather around them. We did a fair, lots of contracts for the army uh, from about 1960 onwards. For the 300 staff who worked in the hat factory at its peak, it was simply a place of work. But for Kevin Herity, the Castlebar hat factory was also home. My father, he was from Clunkeen and my mother was from Darahuran. They married. I think he originally worked in the uh, sugar factory in Chum and wanted to be near her home. So he managed to get a job there. He got the job as a uh, sort of security man, watchman. As, and uh, with that job uh, came a house and gardens and a lot. So we, we were all born there. And the third of oldest six children all delivered by a local nurse, Nurse Byrne, who lived up the road from us. So she was a regular visitor to the house. Yeah, it was attached to the hat factory. It was part and parcel of it. It jutted out the front. Uh, it was three or four bedroom, an enormous, uh, an enormous building. We had plenty of space. And it was uh, quite adequate for our means. Uh, it was heated from the hat factory itself and uh, we were provided with free fuel anyway. So it was a uh, reasonable enough uh, place to live. I more or less had the free run of the place. 
you know. Uh, so I spent the odd while in the dye room. I, I love to see the chemicals being mixed. I think it was Alex Campbell who, who ran that part of the operation. I'd occasionally look in on the um, games of cards that were being played uh, between the big bags of all throughout the day. This has happened from time to time. And uh, my favourite my favorite, uh, pastime would be to climb up on the little ladder that was attached to the side of the factory. I, I'd run around the top of the roof till I uh, till I'd be run off it by by the foreman Paddy Byrne, who who was who would always threatened to tell my father, but he never got around to doing it. I think he was he was looking my own, after my own interests really. This was a major playground for me, and I enjoyed every minute of it. If I wasn't that, I was traipsing around the coattails of Paddy Gilligan, who was the electrician there. I loved, think I was helping him out with the electrics. A thing that has not lost on me to this day. Those who worked in the hat factory came to know their colleagues as friends. As the industry grew, the entire workforce became more responsible and aware of how much it meant to the prosperity of their town. It was a hard day's work for a fair day's pay, but there was one man in the workforce that stood out amongst most of the employees. Tom Kittrick was a super salesman. He was there from the very beginning. But then he took to the roads because sales were going down. You know, hats weren't very popular. And boy, talk about selling sand to the Arabs. Tom could sell laces to the Pope. Oh, he, <laughs> he'd convinced the Pope he was a Protestant and got the job under false pretense. Oh, yes. He would not expect you to do what he wouldn't do himself. He was the first in in the morning, the last out in the evening. And uh, the, the old trick we used to do with Tom was... You could see from one end of the factory to the other. That, that was part of the reason. The glass was there for light, but could see who was working who wasn't. And the trick we used to have with Tom was, if you, if you sometimes you'd spot Tom before he spot you, and, but you'd never move fast. You'd move slowly. So he wouldn't, he wouldn't spot the sudden movement. If you move slowly, and all the advice would always have something in your hand. I'll always remember Tom has been a, a, a great person in the factory. He was a great man for the factory. He'd be a man that would stand out in my mind, you know, when I think about the factory. Tom Ketterick was to have a profound impact on most of those whom he worked with. And he was one of the few men who worked at the hat factory from its inception to its ultimate closure. My first job was on a machine, cutting the brims off the hats. But then they saw a bit of possibility with me and they put me a little up the ladder. So then I was, uh, after a few years, I was put in charge of the hat department. I was dealing with a lot of Jews. There were a lot of Jews, you see. There were the people that were lucky enough got out of uh, Germany at the time. Or wherever, if they were in Belgium or France, they came to Castle Bar. There was a Mr. Lipper. He was in charge of the, where they started the hat and Paddy Gilligan, Lord Ruston, was his understudy. There was a Franz Dealens who was in charge of the next department, and Andy Leonard, Lord Ruston, he was the understudy. Then there was the dyeing department. There was a Mr. Smolka, who was in charge of the dyeing, and Arthur Camel, Lord Ruston, all dead, was um, his understudy and took over eventually. Then there was uh, Mr. Purgus, who was the manager, in the factory, and I was very friendly with him. And uh, there was also Mr. Smolka, who was the manager. Now, Mr. Smolka, at that time, there were no cars, and he went to work, he lived in the main street in Castle Bar, and he went to work every morning in a trap. The man that drove the trap for him was Pat Kearney, who came from Rennes, and he would drove him every morning to work, and drove him back in the evening. He's dead too. Out of all the work in the hat factory, I would say the most would be if there's 15 alive now. I worked for 52 years in the factory and all, because there was three takeovers. I worked for Western Hats first, and while I was with Western Hats, I worked uh, in the hat department. I was in charge there. I checked all the hats before they went to the trimming room. I remember one day, it was in 1952, we had one traveller at that time who was doing the 26 counties. And personally, I thought it was a little too little because uh, we were a big industry if we had tried to go a bit farer. So at any rate, 
I was on the floor one day, Mr. Porges came down and he says, Tom, we have to put you on the road. And I says, why? Well, he says, the other traveller, he says, is very sick. And he said, we know you have great driving experience and we'd like if you started travelling. So I started travelling in 1952. Now, he hadn't been sick at this time. I was doing six counties and he was doing the rest. But uh, later on then, he got a lung collapsed and I had to take over the whole 26 counties. And I remember my first experience going to Cork. I went in to make appointments with all the shops and I went into this Mr Collins on a Monday and the first thing he said to me, it was four o'clock in the evening, he said, this is an awful hour coming to make an appointment for tomorrow. Four o'clock in the evening, I thought that was pretty good. So he kind of gave me a, a bit of a whacking, which I took, but I never said a word to him. And coming out, the chap inside the counter said, we want you badly tomorrow. And I went back on the morning and I got a very big order from him. And they were delighted how well I got on the first couple of days. So I was travelling f- for all the time. I was travelling all the time after that. And uh, we started making uh, j- sweaters and different things. And I was travelling for the whole lot. And the funny thing about it, they didn't like me selling the sweaters. And I remember one day they came along. They told me that I wouldn't be that well up. And I remember one of the boss men came along and he says to me, he says, Tom, we want you to sell sweaters. He says, I, I thought I didn't know how. And I says, why no? Oh, well, they says, we have to give you a break anyway. So they gave it. And they did very well with that after. So I sold them. So then there was another takeover after that. Rehab took over. Now, at this time, I'm 65 years. There's, I was living in Berlin, of course, at this time. And they sent for me and they said, uh, Tom... Uh, we'd like you to work for us. And I said, you know my time, my age. And they said, uh, well, we know your capabilities. So I says, I'm 65 years. I says, people usually retire at 65 years. I said, I don't want to retire. I says, I love work. And they said, uh, well, you'll be with us. So I started with them. I worked with them until I was over 80. The girls in the factory, this was when I started, uh, I was on the, on the floor and time was a very big factor with me. If any of the girls were later, I'd be giving out like stink to them. But they were great workers. You couldn't get better. And the only thing to be saying to me, Tom, when are you going travelling again? Because they love me out of the place. So at any rate, I was very lucky like, to do so many years in it. I enjoy them very much. After six, I was a different person altogether. I, I thought hats, when I went to home in the evening, I thought hats. When I went on the road, it was all hats. So there you are, I could do nothing better than that. For four decades, the hat factory proved to be a vital employer in Castle Bar. People came and went, and Jack Loftus argues that a great atmosphere always existed in the factory where some interesting characters emerged. Paddy Gilligan was a lovely man. He was very jolly and very intelligent. Andy Leonard was very jolly and uh, he you could have the, the crack with um, Andy. Um, in the dye house we had George Darker who really did the dyeing for Arthur Campbell and he would be, you know, a character in his own right. He was an ex-army man and uh, he'd be telling you all kinds of stories. But then you'd have Pat Farland from McCare Road and you had lots of other characters there that... Uh, you know, there was a great comradeship. Now, I mean, what went down in the hat factory at that time, you wouldn't see it at all in a job now. The crack and the things like that, you know. It be, wouldn't be, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> proper in these days and ages that um, that kind of friendship and comradeship and that went on. They were more relaxed, more and more, you know, enjoying themselves with dinners and socials and that, which you don't see nowadays. <laughs> I remember a few stories that they'd be sending up a young fella who'd come in for a bucket of steam to the boiler house. They'd be sending up uh, another lad to the carpenter, Mike Leonard, for um, a rubber hammer, and they'd be looking, sending someone up to Jack Flanagan, who was the electrician at the time, for a skirting board um, scaffolding. And, you know, that, that, that <laughs> they, they, they used to get so much joy out of uh, taking the mickey out of the young fellas and maybe the girls as well in that sense that uh, you hear about the glass nail and the rubber hammer and the bucket of steam 
uh, those things wouldn't go on now. The workforce firmly believed that it shouldn't be a case of all work and no play. A successful social club was set up in the factory and Peggy Lee and Pat Flanagan remember some of the annual events that took place over the years. We had some terrific times there. In, um, in the 50s, especially in the 50s, again, I was in charge of, of the business of, uh, we'd have an outing every summer. And it started with one bus. Maybe we'd go out to Bundorn, uh, down to Kilkey or Buncran or somewhere like that. But it ended up that many a year we had three buses. Now, uh, the two buses would come home at early at maybe nine o'clock and the, the third bus would wait for a dance with the young ones. And uh, I remember it just at the time, I think it was about seven and sixpence uh, for, for the day out, you know, which included a, a, a bit of a meal as well in the evening. And that went on for many, many years. We also had um, factory dances. We had Mick Delahunty every year in January in the town hall. Again, I remember I was in charge of, of the organising of it and the booking of, of Mick. Dances at those days, normal dances were five shillings. Once Mick Delahunty came, we had to charge seven and six because he charged 80 quid for his night. So, uh, but we, we, we made about 50 or 60 quid. There was a great camaraderie there, really. The, there was a committee that would be elected, the social committee, as they, they were called, and we would have uh, two buses every year would leave from the factory for different destinations. We Many years we'd go maybe down Liston Varna, down the you know, the scenic route to Liston Varna, and go to Bundorton, and we went to Winnescrone, and um, a different place like that, and one bus would come home early, and the other bus then would stay on for, for the dance. And also on that bus, you'd have, maybe on the two buses, I, I think I always did for the late bus, but uh, we'd have a man playing a melodion. It, it, it was great. And there was no excessive drink either in those days, you know. Um, no, a lot of us were, were pioneers and you just enjoyed yourself, you know, in a, in a lovely, in a, just a natural way. We didn't need anything. Uh, we had the girls uh, took a war team there for a few years, <laughs> believe it or not. We had our own football soccer league at the back of the factory every every summer, a uh, five-a-side. Uh, there'd be two courts at one end for the goalpost and two courts 100 yards up on the other end. And would you believe that that, that uh, quite a few people from the town came to watch them? We, play, we played after uh, 6 o'clock in the evening. And the final, we had Dennis Lyne used to present us with the little cups. They were about as big as eight cups <laughs> for the for the final. But the trips to Bundorden, the, the the dances, and we had, we had of course the dinner dance in January as well, up in the Traveller's Friend every year. Uh, so it was, it was a good time to be a teenager back in the fifties. I can tell you, and working in the factory, I really enjoyed it. The Castlebar Hat Factory holds a special place in the history of this town. Built at a time of severe economic difficulties, it survived four decades and injected life into a struggling community. The work wasn't easy and conditions were never ideal, but those who worked there appreciated the fact that it gave them a standard of living and a quality of life that was far better than they could have hoped for it will long live in the memory of those who lived through it. Now, there was the downside to it as well. They, they used to use mercury in the hat making and dye, and the, the, uh, the Dream Party wouldn't be too happy with this part of the hat factory. The river would be red one day, it would be green the next day, it would be beautiful bright yellow the next day. They used to flush out the tanks <laughs> down into the river, and all the different hats, and there was a man who went by the name of George Darker, and he'd be dying hats, and the word would go, George Darker was dying all afternoon yesterday, but of course he was dying the hats and the berries. I enjoyed it. I always thought he was underpaid, like, because even when I was travelling, compared to other travellers, but I didn't mind. I loved work. As simple as that. I'm glad I worked there, because... It was a great experience, you know, and not that I know travel is a great experience, but sometimes 
you're told, you know, grow where you're planted. And uh, I suppose that's where I grew, uh, where I was planted. And uh, I never, I never, I never regret it uh, for a moment. And still have friends that I worked with, you know, those of us that are alive, thank God. This programme was produced by Roland Carell and Tommy Marin. The producers of this programme would like to sincerely thank the following contributors. Ernie Sweeney, Pat Flanagan, Peggy Lee, Susanna Sweeney, Jack Loftus, Kevin Herity and Tom Kedrick. This programme was made with the support of the Broadcasting Commission of Ireland's Sound and Vision Scheme.